not only will I be discussing some medical oncologic issues, but for today, I am going to be a poor man's radiotherapist. Um, but I've been helped by uh, a very talented uh, fellow from Dr. Yalom, Joanna Yang, who's uh, lent me some slides uh, to discuss with you. So I think that when we think about um, um, where is this, this disease going, um, and Allison is going to talk about uh, relapse disease, but I think a, a good rule of thumb when people don't realize is that the cure rate for patients with relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma, the cure rate is better than the cure rate for untreated diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. That's how well we do. So sooner or later, we're going to have to take the same concepts that we do in untreated Hodgkin lymphoma and move it to the relapse setting so that we don't overtreat patients in the relapse setting. So I'll talk about untreated disease and where I think that this field is going to be going over the next uh, couple of years, and then Allison will uh, discuss uh, the relapse and refractory patient population. Uh, these are my disclosures. I, for some reason, I didn't give mine in, but I also have to disclose things. Uh, I obviously receive research funding and on a number of advisory boards. Uh, th when I was in Israel, uh, a friend of mine, Dr. Dan, took me to H Thomas Hodgkin's grave, and I would, uh, it's, I would, if you have nothing to do when you're in Israel, um, you probably should go. Um, it's an interesting place in the back of someone's uh, yard. Um, so where are we now with classical Hodgkin lymphoma as of today? And um, I think that. Um, uh, this is a statement that I think is uh, appropriate for large cell lymphoma as well, is the randomized studies we write now are not going to be reported for a long time. Um, and um, something that, uh, that Ionis has championed and has actually taught me for sure is that drug development is moving so rapidly as, is new, as the approval of new drugs that this paradigm of phase one to two to three, it's just got to end because uh, those of us who are senior are never going to see these things come to fruition. Um, we have to be moving things quickly through to change the management of patients. And I'll tell you, I wrote a phase three study in late 2009, early 2010, um, which was floridly positive. And it's unclear to me what its impact is going to be now in 2016, almost 2017. So the phase three data that's out there um, in untreated Hodgkin lymphoma um, is based upon, uh, is in, um, in a disease which I like to categorize into, uh, categorize into five different silos, as the fellows who worked with me, and I, I'm glad a lot of them have come, into favorable and unfavorable early stage Hodgkin lymphoma, unfavorable early stage Hodgkin lymphoma with tumor bulk, favorable advanced stage disease, and unfavorable advanced stage disease. Not all of those categories have phase three data, uh, but they all have standard treatments that folks are using um, as of today. Um, there's phase three data uh, that was published last year, both in the JCO and the New England Journal of Medicine, the RAPID and the H11 trials. I'll discuss those in a minute. There's unfavorable uh, early stage disease that we're treating patients based upon um, a study that was performed and written uh, a number of years ago, which is combined modality therapy based. There are patients who have tumor bulk. Um, one of our talented uh, junior attendings when she was a fellow working with us, Anita Kumar, has, I think, finally redefined tumor bulk in 2016, and I will show you that data. Um, favorable advanced stage disease was published just a couple of months ago by Peter Johnson, um, who will be discussing this at ASH. He'll be uh, giving the uh, ASH Educational Symposium in, un uh, in patients with untreated disease called the Rathel Study. I'll show you some of that. And then lastly, for unfavorable advanced stage disease, um, there's a uh, very interesting phase three random assignment trial that the French reported at ASH last year. And I think if you take these five studies in context, you can see where we are for standard management for patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. Everybody believes that their treatment is better than anybody else's treatment. But if you look at the data that's evidence-based, I'll show you kind of where we're at. And then we could um, do some conjecturing about where it's going to go. So the RAPID study... Um, one of my favorites, actually, um, is a study where patients were randomly assigned to get three months of chemotherapy or three months of chemotherapy plus radiation if they had a PET scan that was negative after, th after, after six doses of ABVD. And what these curves here are show the best results for the radiotherapy arm. 
This is data based upon per protocol analysis, which I think is personally appropriate, meaning that if you got radiotherapy, you were analyzed. If you didn't get radiotherapy, you died from bleomycin, for example, prior to radiotherapy. That, from my mind, shouldn't count as a radiotherapy failure. And in fact, there's about a 6% improvement in patients who get combined modality therapy versus patients who get three months of chemotherapy alone. It's at 91% and about 96.5%. That doesn't mean we should radiate 100 patients to help five. It just means that that was a positive study. Um, I almost always give three cycles of chemotherapy alone for patients with early stage Hodgkin lymphoma without tumor bulk based upon this data set. A second study, which is also a positive study for patients who are radiated, um, looks at patients with favorable and unfavorable Hodgkin lymphoma. And it was a data set that was closed prematurely early because there was just a few relapses in patients who got chemotherapy alone. Actually, only 10 relapses. And the Data Safety Monitoring Committee decided that chemotherapy alone for early stage Hodgkin lymphoma was going to be inferior or would not meet non-inferiority versus combined modality therapy. Um, but once again, if you look at the data set, and the follow-up is short, but for patients who got chemotherapy alone, uh, for patients without tumor bulk and without these symptoms, almost 95% of the patients have done well. Um, David, I don't know if David is here, David has done a similar study uh, that's PET adapted that shows similar results. So for unfavorable early stage patients without tumor bulk as defined in this study, patients with chemotherapy have done extremely well. The third randomized trial is the Rathal study, and this is something that uh, many of us have adopted already. Um, this is fairly straightforward and was low-hanging fruit, to be honest with you. None of us in the room like bleomycin. In fact, all oncologists in the room who've been practicing for probably more than 10 or 15 years have probably seen somebody die from bleomycin toxicity. Um, so it's clearly a drug that we don't like and we'd like to get rid of. This is a fascinating study where patients with advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma um, received two months of chemotherapy. Patients that had a negative PET scan then were randomly assigned to get uh, four more months of ABVD or to drop bleomycin. In the non-randomized arm, patients had a positive PET scan, just received an alternative treatment program, uh, sort of a BACOP treatment of your choice. And let me just uh, take you through this. So if you really look, if you look at the data based upon um, intention to treat or for protocol analysis for patients who had a negative PET scan, you can see fairly comfortably that we do not need to administer bleomycin anymore for patients who have a negative PET scan after two months of chemotherapy. And we've all have adopted this already. Um, and in fact, um, if anything, the patients who got AV AVD alone had less uh, non-hematologic toxicity as well. So um, this, is, this is pretty much done. Um, and that's now a standard treatment strategy. People ask me all the time, what if I'm going, can I drop bleomycin in early stage Hodgkin lymphoma? If I give two months of chemotherapy and I do a PET scan and the PET scan is negative, can I then drop bleomycin with the last two cycles of chemotherapy? The answer to, the answer to that is unknown um, and I don't do it. Um, I'll wait for the studies to be done. This is actually the data for the patients who had PET positive disease, and actually the results aren't that bad. Um, nearly two thirds of the patients who had to receive BACOP did, did okay, but this is not randomized data. It's just treatment that you can use if you feel that it's appropriate. Let's just skip this for a minute. Hopefully Allison will be on time. This is the third study, um, and uh, this is not published. This was presented last year at ASH. It's been submitted for publication. This is a totally different approach uh, that the French did, where they decided that everybody should get a, a more complicated chemotherapy program up front called escalated BACOP. Um, we Americans shun this treatment because of its potential long-term toxicity, but I would say that um, outside of us in Canada, it's commonly used. Um, and what happened here is, let's just look at the right side of the arm, the experimental arm is that patients, all the patients received two cycles of escalated BACOP, and a PET scan was done. It was read centrally by probably one of the best nuclear medicine per, uh, folks in the world, Michelle Mignon. Um, and patients were then randomly assigned to get either BACOP or ABVD. Um, were, were selected to get ABVD if the PET scan was negative, and selected to get BACOP if the PET scan was positive. 
And what's very interesting in this data set is how many patients actually had a negative PET scan after two cycles of Biocop. It's kind of really pretty high, like 88% of folks had a negative PET scan, and in fact, if you have a ne negative PET scan, it's likely that you're gonna do well. Once again, that doesn't mean everybody should get this treatment, it's too toxic. But if you choose to get this treatment because your patient has unfavorable risk factors, for example, one would expect that there's probably gonna be a good outcome short term. Long term is a different story. And here are the results based upon the intent to treat data. Now, if you believe what was said this morning, in the non-Hodgkin lymphoma talk, the large cell lymphoma talk that Jonathan gave and we were speaking about, you can see that there's pretty much very, very little early progression, very uh, minimal primary refractory disease, and then the curves are flat. So these curves are probably gonna hold, at least for progression-free survival. Once again, I'm gonna, it doesn't mean everybody should get this treatment, because it is likely too toxic, but it is good treatment. This is the data based upon if your PET scan, your PET-2 was positive. So these are patients here who had a negative PET scan after two cycles of treatment, just outstanding results. And these are patients with a positive PET scan, remembering that 88% of the patients had a negative PET scan. So um, for me, uh, what I do off of a study, and then we'll talk about uh, the rest of my, at least my talk will be, I think, more interesting. Um, is for fable early stage disease patients, I give chemotherapy alone. I don't give combined modality therapy anymore. Um, it's just not necessary. Uh, for unfable early stage disease without tumor bulk, um, sometimes I give combined modality therapy, and in women I must always give chemotherapy alone. If someone has B symptoms, you should never give short course chemotherapy. Oh, if, you, if you're choosing to give chemotherapy, just give full course chemotherapy or six months of treatment. For unfavorable early stage with tumor bulk, standard is combined modality therapy, and it remains so. For favorable disease, I just showed you the RATHL data, and that's a standard treatment for me right now. And for unfavorable early stage disease, sometimes I'll give BIACOP, and sometimes I will not. But remember, that is only 17% of patients with advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma. So fairly straightforward, and this is fairly uniform uh, management other than what I just said in, in bullet number five, pretty much, you know, in the United States, I hope. So what will be the impact of the newer radiation, radiation therapy strategies, brentuximab, vedotin, and checkpoint inhibitors in patients with untreated Hodgkin lymphoma? Allison will discuss the issue about uh, where there's much more data um, in relapsed and refractory disease. So to begin with, um, Anita, who was here when she was a fellow working with us, uh, for some reason decided to look at 400 CT, reconstructed 400 CT scans on a Mac, no less, just to make it more difficult, um, to see if she could define uh, tumor bulk in the CT era. And the reason is, is that we've been using, for some, for some reason, I don't know, probably some of the younger folks in the room don't even, probably never even seen a chest X-ray. But, um, uh, but this is tumor bulk based upon a chest X-ray. Um, however, it's done in, in a horizontal plane. And what is this? Somebody who has a lymph node from the angle of the jaw that just goes on a long strip that ends here. It's still fairly large, but that was never considered tumor bulk, and that's a 10 centimeter mass. And in fact, there was no data to suggest how big a mass should be in the CT era to, de to determine tumor bulk. And Anita wanted to figure that out, and I think she did a very good job of it. Um, we looked at a series of patients at Memorial. Um, a lot of the patients were treated um, on and off study. Um, we had all the radiation therapy records, and the follow-up was fairly uh, long, so we had uh, uh, the curves are all flat for the patients who were doing well. And in general, patients with early stage Hodgkin lymphoma did extremely well at Memorial. The overall survival was 97%, and progression-free survival was 88%. Um, and uh, what she came up with was a, a cutoff of seven centimeters to consider tumor bulk. And wh why, did, why did she come up with that? Um, if you look at uh, the data, looking at just progression-free survival for the patients who had less than a seven centimeter mass versus more than a seven, seven, seven centimeter mass, 
it was statistically significant. But that doesn't necessarily uh, correlate to how we treated the patients. Many of us give chemotherapy alone for a mass that's less than 10 centimeters. Many of us give combined modality therapy for all the patients. So you had to drill down into this a little bit further. And um, let's just concentrate here on this bottom curve. Up here on the top in purple, if it projects, are patients who had non-bulky early stage Hodgkin lymphoma treated with chemotherapy alone. Everybody did fine. These two middle curves here are superimposable, and they got combined, <coughs> they got combined modality therapy as long as that, uh, whether their tumor mass was bulky or not. And then for some reason, of course we didn't know this when we were doing it, this is the red curve here. And these are folks who got chemotherapy alone who had a single nodal mass that was seven centimeters either in the transverse or coronal plane. And when Anita presented this to our group, we were very, we were very surprised. We actually got it confirmed at both the Dana-Farber and the Mayo Clinic. So we've decided to use this curve here as a benchmark on how we should be studying patients with uh, unfavorable early stage Hodgkin lymphoma. And we've written studies with the prerequisite of a seven centimeter, a seven centimeter nodal mass uh, to consider giving radiotherapy for. And, um, you know, being a medical oncologist, you know, um, you know, how much do I really understand about radiotherapy, right? Um, actually, when I was a fellow, and I've suggested to all the fellows who've always worked with me that they should spend a month or two with Aki, which I did as a fellow. I didn't get any credit as a fellowship for doing that. I'd do that on my own. But, um, and I thought that was very interesting. This way I learned stuff about radiation therapy fields, and I did some consults with him as making believe I was the radiotherapist, the radiotherapy resident. And so I learned quite a bit, but I still didn't really understand why the radiation therapy fields were so big, and that we, would, we were basing radiation therapy fields based upon pre-chemotherapy uh, pre volume. And you know, David Strauss here has championed this, this concept. It's not new. Um, um, others have also looked at trying to see how we can reduce radiation therapy fields, including the radiotherapists. So let me take you through a story that Joanna um, Yang gave me. Uh, very nice uh, slides. And just for education for folks who don't know any of this, um, remember total lymphoid or radiation therapy is a mantle field and an inverted Y and also radiating the splenic pedicle. So this is total lymphoid or radiation therapy. And this is what happened. This is, people got this treatment. In fact, there are folks in this room who have patients who are cured who got total lymphoid or radiation therapy or early stage Hodgkin lymphoma. Of course, there were, there were potential uh, long-term side effects many years down the road, but this certainly cured up to 70% of patients with early stage disease. The radiotherapists, of course, knew that this was toxic, and they decided to see if they can start reducing radiation therapy fields. Uh, back in the early 90s, when I started my, my fellowship, um, and in 1995 when I finished, pretty much we were giving involved field radiotherapy. But just so you understand, this is the amount, this is how much Hodgkin lymphoma was here, and this was the radiation therapy field. And intuitively, um, it's hard for me to understand that, why we do that. Um, obviously, there are radiation therapy reasons to do it, but as a medical oncologist, it's unclear to us why we're giving such large radiation therapy fields. And when I, I talk about Hodgkin lymphoma every single day, either lecturing it or, to, or in clinic, and if you think of radiotherapy as the most effective drug in this disease, um, we should use it, but we can't abuse it. Um, if you just look at some of these dots here, this is a t a, 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 the size of a radiation therapy field for a patient who has bilateral neck disease. Um, Pre-treatment chemotherapy volume. This is the size, here's the mass in green. This is the size of the radiation therapy field that we gave to a patient on one of our clinical trials. We don't realize as medical oncologists, I'm gonna speak for all of us, necessarily what the patients are getting because we refer the patient to radiotherapy. And the radiotherapist is supposed to um, treat the patient based upon what they feel will encompass all the disease. But when you look at the slides this way, the fields are fairly large. Um, about five years ago, the radiotherapists who police themselves much better than we police ourselves, uh, move from involved field to involved site radiotherapy, um, where you can see now the field has gone from, for the same disease, from total lymphoid irradiation therapy to a mantle 
to pretty much a mantle field to an involved site. And the field is getting smaller. Some would argue this is still too big. In Europe, actually, what they do is involve nodal radiotherapy. But in Europe, they, do, they have pretreatment imaging and post-treatment imaging. In the US, the radiotherapist does not see the patient prior to radiotherapy. So the involved site radiation therapy is a little bit larger than involved nodal radiotherapy. And this is now standard therapy worldwide for the way we radiate patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. It's called ISRT. It's been being done now for 10 years. A um, little bit bigger than involved nodal radiotherapy. Um, at places like this, we do 3D planning. Um, but once again, um, I put this in a little, in a different color. Um, I'd like to see the field shrink more. Um, and, and in this last bullet, and I think that this is true, because if you just look at, um, remember, 20 years ago, we were radiating advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma. We were consolidating advanced stage disease with radiotherapy. Now the question must be answered if radiotherapy is going to continue at all in the management of patients with Hodgkin lymphoma, we have to make sure that we do, we're giving the patient the right size field because our treatment is so much better now and our imaging is so much better. So the concept that has been uh, designed by our group is called consolidation volume radiotherapy. And it's a new experimental technique to reduce radiation treatment uh, volume. It's based upon the post-chemotherapy residual CT volume. Obviously, the patients will be PET negative, but it's the size of the mass after AVVD or after BACOP or after whatever treatment program that you're designing. And Joanna has made uh, four examples. I'll try to do, my, do you justice, okay, going through this um, in four cases. One, and all these patients were on a clinical trial that we did that Anita is running, okay? Um, this is a patient with bulky stage 2 Hodgkin lymphoma, 10 centimeter mass. A uh, female, um, here's her mass, okay? And you can see that she has some uh, disease, uh, super diaphragmatic, uh, but outside of the large mediastinal mass. So I just want to, I'll take you through this. So this in blue would be her involved field radiotherapy port, which a lot of the world has been using. In purple here, I guess this is purple. Um, this is the involved site radiation therapy field. And in, the, in a study that we're doing, just surrounding uh, the post-chemotherapy residual site, this would be the consolidation volume radiotherapy. Doesn't look dramatically different, but in reality it is. It is. Um, I'll show you another possibility. Here's an 18-year-old with bulky stage two Hodgkin lymphoma. Here's her sites of disease. Massive lymphoma. This would be her, in dark blue, would be her radiation therapy field. In, over here is an involved site. And just a little bit smaller is her post-chemotherapy residual site. So it looks like, well, why are we doing this? It doesn't look like we're really reducing the radiation therapy field at all by changing that technique because some people have large residual masses after chemotherapy. But that's not always the case. Um, here's a patient who has bulky stage 2 Hodgkin lymphoma who has this presentation, okay? Patient gets chemotherapy, and in fact, there's no disease left over. Here is the original, this would be the involved field, this would have been the involved site, but the patient had a com basically a complete response with chemotherapy. All the lymph nodes were less than one and a half centimeters, so this patient on study wouldn't get any, wouldn't get any radiotherapy at all. And in the last case, uh, which I think is going to be most common, is another bulky stage 2 Hodgkin lymphoma patient, classic presentation. And you can see here is the involved field and the involved site, and here is the small residual volume. So it is dr potentially dramatically smaller with less involvement of heart and lung. And we'll see where this is going to go. And this needs to be done on clinical trial, and the clinical trial that's being done is a study that we're doing with the University of Rochester. Jonathan was here before with City of Hope and with Stanford. This is a study that Anita wrote when she was a fellow. And the first cohort was just published by, uh, by Anita and our group in Blood a couple of issues ago. 
Um, you know what brentuximab vidotin is by now. It's, the, uh, it's an antibody drug conjugate to CD30. It's linked to MMAE, which is basically, so this is basically targeted vincristine or vinblastine, to be honest with you. What we've decided to do is treat patients in, 30, in sequential 30 patient cohorts. Um, the first cohort got BVAVD and involved site radiotherapy at 30 gray. The second cohort we just finished um, got BVAVD and 20 gray. So from your point of view as a medical oncologist, 15 versus 10 days of radiotherapy. The third cohort, we're markedly reducing the radiation therapy field. Uh, we were concerned that uh, there could be some uh, marginal misses, so we decided to give 30 gray of radiotherapy. And in the last cohort, we're going to try to eliminate radiotherapy altogether. And uh, the study kind of looks like this. This is what was published already. Patients get brentuximab, vidotin, and AVD, which is outstanding treatment, which I will show you in a minute. There's then a repeat PET scan. If the PET scan is negative. The patient's got 30 gray in this study. In this first cohort of patients, pretty much 28 out of the 30 patients have done well. The two patients who have not done well both had primary refractory disease, and we've transplanted them, and they're doing fine. Everybody is uh, alive and well. And here's the progression-free survival curve. And remember, in this particular cohort, half the patients had a mediastinal mass of at least 10 centimeters. We're giving only four months of chemotherapy in the entire world outside of us. Uh, pretty much. This gets six cycles of chemotherapy followed by radiation. Here we gave four months of BVAVD and this radiation therapy field. The second cohort was to reduce the radiation therapy by to 20 gray. This study, this cohort is now done. Um, it's ongoing, but everybody who has been restaged is doing fine in this cohort. I always hate saying that because, you know, something will happen. Uh, but everybody's doing well. The third cohort, as I said, we're going to use the radi radiation therapy field will be based upon the residual volume post-chemotherapy. And then the last cohort, we, um, let me just skip this for a second. In the last cohort, we're going to try to eliminate radiotherapy altogether. We could be wrong. It may be that you have to give combined modality therapy. It may be that consolidation volume radiotherapy is, is, too, long, is too small a field. We don't know. But, soon, but it's, it needs to be studied, um, and this is an ongoing high-priority study for us. And uh, now that it's being done at three other centers, it'll move along uh, fairly rapidly. We're not the only ones who've studied BVAVD in patients with early-stage Hodgkin lymphoma. Jeremy Abramson and the Mass General Group have also studied this in non-bulky patients. In general, these are patients who most of these patients would have been eligible to receive a rapid type of approach, three months of chemotherapy. Uh, what they did was they gave a lead-in of brentuximab and vidotin. They actually did a scan to see how those patients did. Um, then the patients got two more cycles of BVAVD. They got another scan, and you can see the schema. Um, this has not been peer-reviewed yet. 34 patients. Most of the patients had uh, stage 1 or stage 2 disease. And their early results, this is, um, this is from Lugano last year, so this is a little old. It'd be nice to see an update of this. Um, the patients have done extremely well. Does that mean BVAVD, after these two studies are going to be published, is going to become standard of care for early-stage Hodgkin lymphoma? Oh, most certainly not. That we're leaving, leading to, for, leaving for the British to do. And the British have now got the son of RAPID, which is called RADAR. Um, which we're hoping to participate in. And what they're going to be doing is give BVAVD for three cycles, then there'll be a PET scan, and then there'll be a randomization uh, to get radiotherapy or no further treatment. Um, and this is going to be an ongoing European study uh, that's going to be, be uh, supported by Takeda, and hopefully Seattle Genetics in the United States and Canada will support a few groups. And this will answer this question in early stage Hodgkin lymphoma. That's non bulky. For advanced stage disease, um, um, Honest, when he was at MD Anderson, um, led this study, uh, phase one, two study of BVAVD um, as a standalone treatment for advanced stage disease. There was a learning curve here. Who knew that BV and ABVD was going to be pulmonary toxic? If you don't do the clinical research, you're never going to find out the answer. Turns out it was. Can't give 
You really can't give rentuximab vodotin with anything else that's pulmonary toxic. It's really not a good idea. Gemcitabine, um, some of the nitrosoureas. Um, we were worried about even giving sequential BV with radiotherapy. That is shown to be okay. Um, and there is a BV checkpoint inhibitor study that's ongoing right now that will be presented at ASH, and you'll be able to see if there was any pulmonary toxicity in that setting. But you can see from the curves here already, in advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma, um, the results are outstanding. Um, and if you really look at the complete response rate, which is based upon PET, almost everybody was in remission at the end of treatment. Um, this then led to the Echelon 1 study, which is finished. Um, uh, it was over 1,200 patients. Our group put 40 patients on this study. We were not, we were the, not the lead center. Actually, the lead center is from Poland. Um, but uh, we were second. Um, and basically, it's a random assignment trial of ABVD versus BVAVD for uh, advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma um, with the goal of a um, endpoint of a 7% improvement in two-year progression-free survival in the experimental arm. Um, does that mean, if that's a positive study, that everybody should get BVAVD with advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma? When 80% or 77 to 80% are cured with ABVD alone, does that mean everybody should get this treatment? That's unclear, since 12 cycles of BVAVD cost a quarter of a million dollars, and ABVD is free, so we have to be careful on what we choose to give patients. But there will be patients who are going to get BVAVD. And then lastly, um, Allison um, is going to initiate a study of moving the checkpoint inhibitors into front line um, with standard chemotherapy. It's a fairly complicated study, and I think that our group has spent a long time trying to figure out how to, how to deal with this uh, for the obvious reason that patients who get ABVD do extremely well. And we really have to decide who should get these novel therapeutic approaches. So I'll just show you the schemas, which, are, which, which Allison made the other day, which are fairly complicated to begin with. Um, and um, we have a couple of cohorts. One is for patients who are less than 60, one are patients who are older than 60. Everybody's going to get two months of ABVD. We already know, based upon two studies, that the likelihood of having a PET negative response here is 82%. Not 80% or 83%, it's 82% in 2,000 patients. So that's probably what it's going to be. Um, therefore, the majority of patients are going to go down this arm, and the rest of the patients are going to go down this complicated schema here, where we're going to figure out the safest way to give nivolumab in combination with ABVD or AVD chemotherapy. The reason Allison is doing this is because, you know, David, Carol, Honest, Andy, and I, we're going to be retired when this thing is, for this probably thing will be, to be finished, but it has the potential of changing management. Uh, but we'll take a long time to do, and we'll certainly have to open it at other centers. It is the hope that once we figure out how to do this, and um, the nivolumab can be given safely with AVD, that we'll move it straight up front and give more doses of nivolumab in patients who are PET2 avid. And hopefully this can also change uh, treatment paradigm. It does, does that mean everybody should be getting this treatment? No, we should figure out more selectively using various techniques on who should get uh, therapy that's much more expensive and, and obviously somewhat novel. Remembering for those of you, for most of you who weren't born in the room, you know, ABVD was written by, um, by Bonadonna in 1973, okay, so that would be 43 years ago, and we're still using it, so it must be pretty good treatment. Um, and just like with large cell lymphoma, this is my last slide, for whatever reason, just as the outcome with RCHOP is improving, even though we've known how to give RCHOP since 1999, but the results seem to be 15 to 20 percent better now, the results in Dr. Canellis' study with ABVD published in the New England Journal of Medicine in, the, in 1992 is at 64 percent. Somehow now, in 2016, we're, at the, we're close to 77 or 78 percent with advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma with ABVD, and we're given the same treatment at the same doses. So something has happened. Um, I don't think we're getting smarter. Dr. Canellis is a smart guy. Um, so uh, 
just what am I going to do in four years? It's really only three years. Are we going to have changes in management of Hodgkin, untreated Hodgkin lymphoma in three years? Not for favorable early stage Hodgkin lymphoma. The results are too good. Um, for unfavorable early stage Hodgkin lymphoma, I'm, I'm feeling BVABD is going to be a treatment. I'm hoping that based upon ours and other and others. Uh, data, whether or not we get a radiator or not, is we'll see what happens. Patients with tumor bulk are probably going to continue to get radiated. Um, patients with favorable advanced stage disease and unfavorable advanced stage disease. Um, sometimes we, uh, we, we make fun of uh, medical oncologists in the community. I don't know how they do it. They have to take care of all these different cancers, you know, and they have to know a little bit about everything. But one thing they do extremely well is they treat patients based upon the results of phase three randomized studies. That's how patients need to get treated. And I would argue if BVABD is, is, meets its primary endpoint in the Echelon 1 study, it's going to be used in the community. So I'm going to stop here, and I'll segue over to Allison, and then I guess we can take some questions uh, about Hodgkin lymphoma when we're finished. Thanks for your attention.